Aren't laws a funny thing when you think about it? I mean, what is a law? Is it something you must do, something you should do, something you might do? In Star Trek, who knows? With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 weirdest laws in the Star Trek universe. Number 10, General Order 24. This is a law that, no word of a lie, gives the captain permission to sterilize a planet. Okay, let's think about that one for a second. They are covered by Federation law to wipe out all life on a world. This order was given only twice in recorded history, once by Captain Garth of Izar and once by Captain Kirk. Now, neither time it was actually enacted on it. It's more of a, a kind of a ultimatum, a kind of a last threat. However, had either captain acted on it, they would have been covered. A more recent candidate for this law would be during the hunt for Michael Eddington in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Captain Sisko has become completely obsessed with tracking down Eddington because the man betrayed his uniform. In the course of this chase, Eddington ups the stakes. He poisons a Cardassian world, which means the Cardassian settlers will have to leave, which in theory leaves it free for Maki colonization. In response to this, Captain Sisko detonates two trilithium resin torpedoes into the atmosphere of a Maki colony, which effectively makes the planet barren for the next 50 years. Now, while nobody dies, Sisko was completely covered by General Order 24. Dark. Number nine, Special Order 66715. This order is effectively we can do what we want order. And it refers to the establishment in a roundabout way of section 31. Effectively, it gives the organization whatever means they need to countermand any threats to the Federation. While it's good in theory, it effectively establishes the SS in space. This law predates the Federation. It was actually part of Starfleet, but it is part of the initial Federation Charter. Now, the fact that they are given so much leeway is, in effect, something that hinders them in, you know, Captain Pike's day. At this stage, the, uh, Section 31 have become a military force to be reckoned with. They have their own star bases. They're, don't muck with these people. But, because they're so secretive, that allows control to completely take over them and there is no oversight. Starfleet is not aware of this. Now, as the years go on, they come down to a more secretive organization. I should say secretive, but they're an open secret. When they appear on Deep Space Nine in the form of Agent Sloan, when Cisco chases up with Starfleet, you know, what the hell, guys? They say, oh yeah, 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 uh, that's, that's, that's shocking, isn't it? Number eight. General Order 6. General Order 6 is quite straightforward. It calls for a Federation starship to self-destruct if all life on the ship has expired within a 24 hour period. In theory, that works perfectly. And yet, it seems to be one of those laws that's really more of a, say Bill, did, did you remember that General Order 6? Oh yeah, yeah, I meant to install that. The USS Glenn, might be one of the first examples of this. By the time the USS Discovery catches up to them, all life on the ship is dead, except of course for the tardigrade. So look, there's an ar argument there for, you know. Then there's the USS Defiant. The entire crew was killed by the Tholians, and yet the ship was able to rock up 100 years later in the mirror universe. There is also the USS Lantry, which was the Miranda-class starship, whose entire crew were killed by a disease that makes them age rapidly. Now, the Federation ship Enterprise has to destroy that ship. It isn't self-destructing. The SS Tilskovsky, same thing. The ship is entirely barren of life, and yet it's totally fine, functionally at least. As you can see, this order seems to be more of a, it's a good idea, you know, in theory, let's not spread any disease. But of course, it obviously depends on the day of the week. It depends on, you know, whether the moon's on the left or the right, or really depends on whether the engineer got around to installing that program. Ah, don't tell me. Tuesday. Number seven, the death penalty for Talos IV. 
Talos IV, along with obviously Earth and Rigel, is one of the earliest planets that's ever been introduced in Star Trek, right from the original episode, The Cage. Captain Pike and the crew of the Enterprise encounter the Talosians, they encounter Vina, the only survivor of the SS Valiant, and what they then discover is that Starfleet just kind of wings it when it comes to laws. We learn by the events of the Menagerie that the death penalty has been put on place on anyone who visits the Talos Star Group. This is because Spock kidnaps Pike and commandeers the ship to bring it toward Talos. He's facing the death penalty. However, the events of the cage took place before the events of Star Trek Discovery. And in Star Trek Discovery, Admiral Katrina Cornwell tells Laurel that Starfleet has no death penalty at all. Now look, maybe it just hadn't been established yet by the events of that episode and by the events of the Menagerie it was put into law. But that also doesn't track because later in the original series, Sulu says there is only one crime that merits the death penalty. It's heavily inferred that that crime is treason which speaks nothing of the death penalty for Talos IV. That death penalty, in fact, was waived in the Menagerie because, to boil it down simply, ah, it's cool, Starfleet likes Pike. Ah, Spock was only looking out for his captain's grand. Like, delighted Spock wasn't killed, will you have a bit of consistency? Number six, Regulation 3, Paragraph 12. A captain shall, by any means necessary, do whatever force they can to safeguard the lives of their crew. Captain Rudy Ransom tries to quote this regulation to Janeway to justify his actions aboard the USS Equinox to save his crew after it was whisked into the Delta Quadrant by the caretaker. Using any means necessary, sure, but it's not that that's vague, it's just there are common sense exclusions to this. One of those exclusions is mass murder. Ransom sanctions the murder of the nucleogenic life forms to increase the propulsion power of the USS Equinox to help it get home faster. That means hundreds would have to die to get his crew home. That is not something that Starfleet sanctions, and it certainly is not something that Janeway sanctions. That then leads to the tense standoff, the hunt, and the eventual destruction of the USS Equinox. It's it's quite a stark there but for the grace of God episode when it comes to USS Voyager, but in the end, thankfully, Captain Ransom does see the error of his ways. Number five, Protocol 28, subsection D. In the event of hostile takeover by an enemy force, the EMH is to deactivate and wait for rescue. This rule is bonkers. This rule could end up killing so many members of the crew. If, by the letter of the law, the EMH is to shut down as soon as the ship has been taken over, what would have happened during the events of the killing game in Star Trek Voyager? Which was, I hasten to add, the same season as Message in a Bottle. The EMH Mark II is the one who quotes this protocol to the familiar EMH from USS Voyager. But, had our EMH followed that rule, how many of the Voyager crew would have died during the events of the killing game? The Herogen completely take over Voyager. There is, for a time, no chance that the crew is going to retake the ship. Therefore, they've been condemned to these blood sports and war games again and again, with Herogen medicine looking after them. How many of them were gonna die by the end of that? There's another example of this, the Kazon takeover of USS Voyager during the events of Basics. I suppose there's an argument that Seska activated the doctor when she walked into sickbay, but by the letter of the law, she should have had to activate him. It's, uh, it's a bit of a woolly one, but also it bears thinking about that Voyager does get taken over a lot. Number four, sexual relations law. In Archer's day, back on the NX-01, there apparently was a regulation that officers could not engage in relations together. When T'Pol is infected with a parasite and she begins to go through her pond far early, both Phlox and Reed state fairly definitively that they are not able to engage in relations with her as it is against the rules. If you go forward to the original series, McCoy definitively states there's no rule against officers getting together and having a good time. So potentially by this stage, it's been done away. Certainly when we go forward into the next generation, well, Riker and Troy, case closed really. However, in Deep Space Nine, there is an event which seems to call for this rule. 
When Worf and Jadzia Dax are sent on a mission together to Sukara to rescue a Cardassian informant, Dax is injured on the mission. Worf attempts to go ahead to complete the mission but is unable to leave her there, goes back and rescues her, which results in a complete mission failure and the informant is killed. Sisko tells him in no uncertain terms that while he understands his actions, that will effectively rule him out from ever getting his own command. Because there's a rule in place. It's a bit of a woolly one, and it seems to be a bit of a pick and choose. Number three, General Order 34. This law calls for any Starfleet captain to tolerate to the highest levels the individual cultures and customs of the various races that serve aboard their ship or station. This comes up during the events of the next generation with Commander Worf. He kills Duros, is perfectly entitled to do so following Klingon law. Now, Picard struggles with this, and he says that all of the officers aboard his ship have pledged to follow Starfleet's laws, but that's at odds to General Order 34, because Starfleet's laws, laws they accept this. In a way, because it's Duros, it gets a little bit kind of swept under the rug and we don't really talk about it anymore. Flash forward to, bingo, it's Worf again, but this time on Deep Space Nine. His brother Kern arrives on the station and he asks his brother to kill him as part of the Mok Tavor ritual. Now, again, perfectly legitimate Klingon ritual. This will enable Kern to go to Stovacor with honor. This is following, of course, Chancellor Garon's stripping of the House of Moog of all of their lands and titles. Effectively, Kern is an outcast. At least Worf has his uniform. They begin, they prepare, and Worf brings the knife down. Now, in an uncharacteristic display of ignoring Klingon customs, Jadzia Dax completely interrupts the uh, ceremony, gets Kern to sickbay, and this is surprising because Dax, out of anyone else on the station, should have understood what was going on. Sisko tears Worf a new one. Again, this is a situation where General Order 34 seems to have been written without Klingon ritual in mind. So it seems to be, we will accept whatever form of dress you wear, we will accept whatever weird singing competitions you do, but we will not accept knives to the sternum. Understandable on paper, but Klingons are built different. Number two, the Omega Directive. Now, I'll be straight with you. If this was any other situation, I would not be discussing this law with you. We would not be having this meeting. And frankly, you would all be put to death as soon as we were finished. But it's okay. Trek cultures authorize this. The Omega Directive calls for the immediate destruction of any detected Omega particle. It is so important, in fact, to destroy it that the Prime Directive is put to the side over this one. Think of it as a kind of Starfleet's version of the purge. Any and all crimes are legal as long as it results in the destruction of the Omega molecule. It is so worrying to Starfleet because it's not simply that it's an incredibly explosive molecule, it's that it disrupts subspace. It effectively destroys warp drive. So if enough of this stuff goes off, spacefaring travel as Starfleet knows it is gone. However, they're so afraid of the knowledge of this molecule getting out that you are restricted to the rank of captain or higher to actually have knowledge of this. And that's a problem. If you think about it, while Starfleet has that restriction, the Klingons, the Cardassians, and the Romulans have no such restrictions. So this is a secret that can't possibly be kept no matter how much Starfleet tries. There's also a little knock-on to this as well, that if, for example, a lieutenant discovers Omega, but doesn't know what it is, that could lead to missing it. Hopefully you would assume that whatever Starfleet tech the lieutenant is wearing, they will be able to, you know, the tech itself will detect it, but that's not a guarantee. Number one, General Order One, the Prime Directive. The Prime Directive is Starfleet's highest law, bar the Omega Directive, where it says that you cannot interfere in the internal runnings of another civilization, and also not to expose future technology to pre-warp civilizations. Sounds good. Captains like Kirk seemed to use this law as a funny guideline, really, as opposed to an actual law. And there was plenty, 
plenty of breaks to this law during the original series run. Now, there was very obviously dreadful outcomes from this, such as John Gill's establishment of himself as the Fuhrer of the Ecosians in Patterns of Force. Yeah, there you go. Prime Directive would have been pretty obviously smashed to bits there. A private little war, Kirk arms Miramani's people so that they can fight back against the Klingons. Now they justify it as evening out the odds, but that is completely ignoring the Prime Directive. As things go along, it becomes both the highest, highest law of Starfleet and also a roadblock for when Starfleet really wants to get something done. Admiral Dougherty went into an alliance with the Sona, totally sanctioned by Starfleet, to steal the planet of the Baku, sanctioned by Starfleet, but obliterating the Prime Directive in the process. Dougherty went a bit too far when he sent the Sonar to destroy the Enterprise because he knew once the Federation Council saw what was actually happening, they would rescind their permission. All in all, the Prime Directive, it's an easy rule to write, but not always the easiest one to follow. Janeway, out of any other captain in Starfleet, has probably been tested on this the most and yet remained resolute. So it can be done, unless of course you're James Kirk, in which case he's like, <laughs> cute. That's it for our list today, guys, of the weirdest laws in Star Trek universe. If you can think of anything weirder, drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Whatever you do going forward, try not to bring yourself to the attention of Section 31. Try not to establish yourself as a dictator of an alien world. And if at all possible, live long and prosper. Thanks a million, guys.